Pronunciation is not just for show, it's, it, it's does the work of yeah. communicating. Good morning everybody and welcome to another episode of Novelties, the life of a teacher researcher. With me today a very special guest who has been teaching all over the world, who has who is an expert in pronunciation, he's an author as well and a conference speaker. Next to me is Mark Hancock. Mark, welcome, thank you very much for being here. My pleasure. Great, it's great to have you here. It's a cold and windy day. I know, it is, it is. We are in Tessel, Spain today yeah. and so Mark gave a great talk on phonology and how we can include that in the educational system. Now I thought, Mark, and that's going to be the first question, that many people might be worried about having an accent uh, that might be not similar to the native English accent. Uh, what would you say to these people? Um, don't worry about that because the majority of speakers of English in the world have an accent which is not uh, native speaker as, you, as, as it's called. Uh, that's the vast majority of people. So uh, obviously it's not a problem. The problem with um, an accent, say a Spanish accent, is is those parts of it which are not um, globally intelligible. So yeah. the parts of it which are intelligible don't need to be changed. If it isn't broken, you don't have to fix it. Right. I like the idea that you say that it is not necessarily a problem if people actually have their own accent, because at the same time it forms part of their personality as well. But then again, how I've been told, and I think how many people have been told as well, is by just teachers correcting us on specific words and saying, no, it's not pronounced like that, it is pronounced like this. That, um, that's an interesting way of putting it, this, it's not pronounced, that's a passive. Um, and uh, the passive conceals the, the, the actor, the, the subject of the verb, right? Yeah. It's not pronounced by who? Um, the assumption being that there are some kind of a referee group, a cloud of people judging your accent. And these, this kind of people, uh, something like maybe the Queen or an RP speaker, some idealised uh, referee, that person doesn't exist. Or if they do, they're not relevant. Right. So, uh, right that's yeah. true. I agree, I agree. Be careful for the weasel passive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I agree, I agree. But what I also found very interesting about your talk yesterday is the fact that you mentioned the difference when actually teaching between focusing on a product hmm. and focusing on the process. Could you further elaborate on that, yes. referring to the pronunciation? It's like you were just saying that uh, you've had this experience of being uh, taught it is not pronounced like this. That, that's a t an example of focusing on the product. You are saying you're, you're imagine the teacher is supposing that they're teaching an accent. Right. Um, whereas what I think they should be teaching is uh, a skill, yeah. um, a capacity to uh, modify the way you speak according to the person you're speaking to. Um, that's called accommodation. That uh, is, that's a process. You're learning to get better at that process. Yes. Not, you're not trying to emulate the accent of some uh, idealized referee you're trying to get better at adapting to the person you're speaking to great. in English. Great, mm. I like that. No, and I like that idea as well because we're creating basically when we're learning a language we're trying to express ourselves in our own unique way. You want to be the person who you already are but in the other language as well and this way we can like try to learn this skill along the way not as a process of, or not as a, as a way of just saying everything correctly as one person, as the teacher may say, yes. it, but try to find your own way. There is no correct, is there? In pronunciation there's no such thing as correct. Love that. Um, so it's not like grammar. Right. Uh, even there you might argue there's no such thing as correct, but in pronunciation there isn't. There are literal reasons. The only kind of error that I, I would call an error is a spelling-induced mispronunciation. Right. When, when when the student doesn't under, doesn't realise what the spelling, how to read from the spelling to pronouncing, that might be an error. Right. For example, if they say pear for the fruit, pear, that's a spelling-induced error. Right. That's the only kind of error. Every, everything that's to do with accent is not an error. It's just a different way of 
stitching. Exactly, yeah. exactly. No, I love that, I love that. But now the big question is, because I love the whole idea behind it, but the biggest question remains the, the how. How can we do this as teachers? Now, you've been writing several books about how to include this in the classroom, but if you could give a short summary of how teachers could actually try to implement this in the classroom, this idea of focusing on the process instead of the product, the learning of the skill in itself. Um, well, one thing is the feedback. Um, when you're teaching pronunciation, you don't need to speak in terms of correctness or it's pronounced this way. You can go, well, I pronounce it like this. Um, other people pronounce it that way. Uh, you pronounce it this, you know, we talk about it uh, as equals. Right. Uh, uh, rather than as some kind of superior to um, an inferior. Right. Uh, as sometimes it's done. We, we can discuss uh, and uh, the students can learn Oh, maybe the way I say uh, "ech" as in "egg," "ech," maybe that won't be very understandable uh, in other parts of the world, and maybe I could work on that. That would be their choice. If, right. they, if, if they think saying "ech" is part of their personality, they can continue to do that. But that's their business. Right? right. So, as you say, people can choose what they pick, pick up, but they can only choose if they know why. If they know that that's not intelligible, or that's intelligible, or that doesn't matter, they need to know that. That's right. where the teacher comes in. They can guide you in as to what's important. Right. But but at the same time, um, you mentioned the role of the teacher and seeing them as equals. So it's not the teacher um, actually saying how things are in other parts of the world. It's basically making them aware of what is taking place as well. But yes, it doesn't mean that the teacher does need to be aware, the teacher needs to be aware of that. Yeah. In order to help the students. Right. So I, uh, I think it's advisable for the teacher to know some of the ways that accents vary around the world. Right. I give an example in my talk of, uh, for example, th, the th sound, th. The teacher needs to be aware that that varies in different accents. In Irish, for example, it, it sounds like t. Yeah. In London, it sounds like f. In French, it sounds like s. And if That's the teacher true. has a few examples like that that they can say, then they can help the students assess how important it is yeah. to, to to get that accurately. Because after all, if, if the Londoner can say I think, then the student can do the same if they want. Yeah, no, it's true. It's true. No, I totally agree with that. So it's basically making them aware as well of how pronunciation is involved in different parts of the world in order for them to find their own unique way within yeah. this world of English language speakers. Yeah, at the same time. and to know what's important and what isn't important in terms of intelligibility. Right, yes. exactly. And then at the, at the same time, it's not just teacher-student correcting. This also can be done in collaborative practices, you meant. Yes. Now, you have a book in your hand um, which is pronunciation, <laughs> pronunciation pair works. Yeah. What is so special about this book, according to you? Well, pair works is uh, where one student is trying to communicate something, it's called an information gap. One student has some information, they want to transmit it to the other students without them seeing, so just, right. by, just verbally. And uh, it demands that they they are accurate in some way or uh, not so much accurate but intelligible intelligible to the other uh, if they say something and the other person understands it differently from what they intended then they need to modify the way they're speaking yeah. until the other one understands it as they intend yeah. that's the best way of um, improving pronunciation is to is by trial and error you say something, it doesn't work, you try it again a different way until it works. Right. And then you realise, ah, so pronunciation is important for, get, for communicating, I see. Yeah. That's, that's when the student realises pronunciation is not just for show, it's, it it's, does the work of yeah. communicating. Exactly. And that's the importance of pair works in pronunciation. Great, yeah. yeah. And then 
what what you said again as well students having the choice to also look for ways in order to make them sound in the way that they want to sound in line with their personality and getting the message across um, that personality thing that's quite up to the student but right. uh, sure. if somebody sure, if the student uh, wants to communicate with the other they're going to have to bend over backwards we all have to bend over backwards right. including native speakers in the globalized community we all have to adapt the way we speak to, to make ourselves understood yes. students have to do that uh, teachers have to do that too we all have to adapt the way we're speaking and we do naturally in some circumstances have you noticed that, um, people have a way of speaking to children differently sure. when they speak to adults that's true uh, people tend to speak slower to a, a foreigner that's true right. Do that by instinct. That instinct can be improved through teaching, so that you can adapt the way you speak in a global forum. Great. Yeah. Great. I think that's a wonderful way to finish this interview. I would like to thank yeah. you very much, Mark. Thank you. I'll be buying your book today. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Mark, for being here and taking your time to explain your knowledge. Speaking a language is always a social process, but at the same time, that means that there are different cultures involved as well. Now most of the teachers who teach English, they keep on teaching English in the country where they've learned how to teach English. But would you recommend other teachers to gain some experience abroad? Do you think it is a good idea to start teaching in other countries as well? And at the same time, many teachers still want to do the CELTA course. So would you recommend teachers to take the CELTA course in other countries as well? Now that's going to be the question of the week. So either leave a comment on Facebook on Novelty's vlog, on Instagram at The Teacher Researcher, on Twitter at Dirk Laagwart or on the YouTube channel The Teacher Researcher. Have a lovely week everybody and remember once again that a great teacher never stops learning. And I see you next week. Take care. Bye. -bye.